Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Transforming the Nonprofit Sector Panel 3. Uh, the discussion today will be on self directed peer to peer and collaborative learning. And I would like to start with a confession that I hated learning when I was in school. Uh, if I look back at my primary and secondary school days, uh, did I do well? Okay, I did reasonably well, but I hated learning. And the reason is because learning was always an individual effort, right? And your classmates were basically your competitors and you needed to do better than them. So I, I would have a friend who would, after every test, we get the test results and he'd come and say, hey, how much did you get? How much did you get? And before the test, he would be like, this test is so difficult. You know, I would surely fail. Uh, so, so tough, you know, I didn't study much. And then he would get his test scores back and he would get an A. And so we were very annoyed that he was so competitive. Um, but that was how it was, right? So the context is this is a reasonably good school, right? And the kids were all very compliant to the system. But ironically, they were so compliant to the system, but they were so competitive to one another. Amongst very close friends, maybe you help each other out a little bit. You didn't understand what the teacher was saying. But largely, uh, learning was an individual effort. And, um, and sometimes the, the evaluation rubrics at the time weren't so clear. So um, I was a very obedient student and I, was, I did okay. So sometimes the teacher will get me up on the board and say, okay, Justin, do this math sum. And they hadn't known that I had declined in my academic abilities. So they had this impression, this halo effect that, oh, Justin is a good kid, right? And so I would go up to the board and I would struggle. And then the teacher will say, oh, if Justin can't do it, that means the rest of you also cannot. Right? And then this will, oh, this will irritate the hell of my friends who felt that they were smarter than me. And so that was the experience of school for me. And when I found out that learning can be self-directed, peer-to-peer collaborative, I was uh, instantly intrigued because this was entirely alien to my experience. My experience was you were dismayed when your classmates or your friends were smarter than you. But, you know, can we instead rejoice if your friends were smart? Could they not then be the ones who taught you? Could you not feel like you were in the same boat, that you were learning things together? And if you were smart at something, you can teach me that. And if I was good at something else, I can teach you that. Um, and so some of my uh, adult experiences in learning have been far more uh, fulfilling. It's more peer-to-peer. -peer. We'll explore a topic or an interest or concept together with others. We'll watch a film together, discuss it, read a book. But although in, in highly unstructured or unfacilitated ways, um, and if, if uh, kind of bring it back to today's uh, audience in the nonprofit sector, uh, a lot of us kind of work with marginalized uh, groups, uh, maybe youth or, or seniors. Uh, at least for the youth, if you don't do well in school, uh, you get tuition. And that's our standard solution, right? If you couldn't afford tuition, then there is assistance for it. And in the meantime, the tuition industry balloons to this billion dollar industry in Singapore, feeding off the anxieties of teachers, parents, students alike. And, and so the largest significance for me uh, for this kind of peer-to-peer -peer concept is if we could unlock the learning capacities of communities themselves so that they can teach and learn from one another, you know, would that make a dent? Um, and it's um, uh, not just within a learning circle or peer-to-peer -peer group itself, you know, but if this group has access to the collective wisdom of a much larger network of resources and learners, will it... Uh, what would it do? So this is exactly why we're so excited to discover peer-to-peer -peer university and to have uh, Griff Peterson uh, come tell us about it because they not only kind of create access to resources for learners, but they also have a way to structure and facilitate the learning process. Um, so the, the relevance for the nonprofit world, I suppose, if you're working with youths or seniors, lifelong learning, all that, right, there's uh, some kind of possibilities there for you. But also amongst the nonprofit professionals uh, themselves, if you, we already understand communities of practice and maybe communities of practice can be structured more in terms of peer-to-peer -peer or collaborative learning, I think that might be interesting. Uh, maybe certain attendees here would resonate more, especially I think of after-school care where I just passed by my local after school care and this is the you know the void deck of a, a a flat and the kids inside were reading comics and playing video games, which I love, you know, you should do that. Uh, but they were just kind of each on their own desks doing their own thing, some were doing homework. And I wondered, you know, maybe peer to peer learning can be can be done there. That might be interesting. Uh, many of you run training programs as, as part of your key business or you run academies or the training arm of your organization. Um, I actually uh, got 
uh, into this uh, concept uh, from a project with Beyond Social Services and I think some of them are in the room today. And thanks to Beyond, you know, they were trying to help set up uh, peer learning groups for their youth. And so we dived a little bit deeper into this and I found out more about it. And uh, I'm also very glad to have um, uh, Raja with us today from Cinda and IPS is working with Cinda to try to pilot a kind of learning circles uh, in the community. And when we discovered, uh, and we wanted to have discussions come and kind of weigh in on and talk about the, the concept, uh, uh, the National Library kindly uh, offered up a representative. And when Zul came and said, oh, hey, by the way, we do all this uh, kind of support for learning communities, I say, wow, you can't be a discussion. You, ha you have to come and do a mini presentation. So he'll do that uh, after Griff goes. Um, but I, I do think that there's an even larger significance here. Uh, so in Griff's presentation, he pointed out to, you know, open educational resources. Uh, and so there's a movement towards uh, freeing up access to education. And I just want to read you a couple of quotes from the stuff that he pointed me to. Uh, the open society, open education imagines a world where each and every person on earth can access and contribute to the sum of all human knowledge, which I think is great because the whole uh, conference is about um, mutual aid and the commons is about solutions to help us help one another. And, you know, we often go to, there's an, always an enclosure of property, right? There's an enclosure of property and then to access it, you have to pay for it. That's how the market works. And education is the same. I'm, I'm in a research center and academia is very similar. You, have, you, you produce academic knowledge, it goes into a publication and people have to pay for it. Uh, if I had to make my research accessible, uh, uh, I have to pay a thousand or two thousand dollars to the journals just so that people can freely read it. Um, but so that's that larger thing, and it's it's not just making educational resources uh, accessible, but also technologies that facilitate collaboration and and flexible learning. So there's open pedagogy and all that, and maybe Griff can tell us more about that. But in relation to this, we have. Um, a film screening on education systems that value participation. And this will be in um, the 6th of August. And I will uh, I will sh put in the chat uh, a film screening that a Good Space is doing. And these are by filmmakers who um, have studied uh, democratic schools uh, all across the world. And if you, it happens to be this Saturday, 2 to 5 p.m. It's $30. It's not cheap. But if you, if want, you it want to, you can, <laughs> you can watch that. There's also uh, a follow-up learning journey IPS is organizing uh, with the actual filmmakers itself. Uh, this happened uh, fortuitously. And so uh, the learning journey is on the 15th of August and Jasmine will send an invite to all of you then. Um, and so uh, without further ado, can we invite Griff to come tell us more about P2PU? Over to you, Griff. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Justin. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, it's actually uh, six o'clock in the evening yesterday uh, for me. I live in Phoenix, Arizona in the United States. Um, I was very, very happy to uh, get this invitation and, and be able to come and speak with you. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the nonprofit sector uh, in Singapore. And I think Justin really, uh, you set a really nice framework for how we try to think about um, teaching and learning um, at peer-to-peer -peer university. Um, and so I'm gonna share some slides. Uh, generally the idea for the next 40 or so minutes is that I will uh, give you a bit of background on why my uh, organization has come to the idea of, of peer learning as, as sort of the way that we uh, not just run educational programs, but also just conduct the way that we work as an organization. Um, we'll talk a little bit about different examples of how different types of nonprofits have, have come to work with us. Uh, and, then I, and then we'll sort of move from there um, into some sort of thinking around uh, how each of your organizations and the nonprofit sector in general can better um, utilize uh, peer learning uh, principles and, and, and open educational resources as well. Um, I want to thank again, you know, Justin and Ruby and Jasmine and everyone who's helped make this a very easy process to get started. Um, and uh, yeah, I think with that, we can, we can get started with the slides. Um, I really liked the idea that this was a nonprofit conference. I think a lot of the times I get invited to, to talk somewhere, we are talking specifically about education. 
Um, but the thing about learning and education is that we are always learning and we're always getting an education, whether we're in school, whether we are thinking we're doing a specific education program or not. And I think uh, I really like that we're able to talk so freely about peer learning and principles of education in environments that are not just limited to classrooms, because any organization is a learning or a teaching organization if you take a, a particular perspective. And I think that's a really, really, um, yeah, just like a really important thing to keep in mind as we sort of go about our, go about our work and try to build the world that we wanna build. Um, so I wanna first start by just acknowledging my colleagues. Uh, we are a four person team. As I said, I'm in Arizona and uh, towards the West Coast of the United States. My colleagues, uh, Kamisha is in Detroit, Michigan. Lydian is in uh, near Atlanta, Georgia and Dirk is in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, we have worked uh, together for seven years or so to build this learning circle program. Uh, and you can see a number of the dots represent the places that we've helped to start learning circle communities. Um, we are not everywhere in the world. There's a, a nice sort of empty space on the right hand side of the, of the map. And we'd, we would love to sort of um, let this conversation be the beginning of some more relationships uh, in Singapore. And so I will certainly share my contact information at the end. And, my colleagues and I would be very, very happy to, um, to sort of talk with you uh, about more specific details after, after today. So Peer-to-Peer um, -peer University is a, uh, the organization that I serve as the executive director of. We are a nonprofit organization uh, based in the United States. And really the sort of principle of our work is that learning is better together. Um, the organization was founded as a result of the Cape Town Open Education Declaration, which was written in 2008. And if you haven't read this, I recommend reading it. It's very short, it's uh, you know, freely available online. And the spirit of that uh, declaration was that the way we learn um, is so much based on sort of the tools and the resources that we have access to. And in that way, publishing companies really determine so much about, you know, how we learn because we think about, you know, well, how do we get access to books? How do we share those books? What are the rules regulating how we create new knowledge? Um, and basically a group of people came together in 2008 and said, the internet allows us to think very differently about the way that knowledge is created, knowledge is shared. Um, and it was really sort of a manifesto for how teaching and learning and educational institutions could think and act differently to Justin's point, you know, how do we, try to imagine worlds where faculty aren't so incentivized to put all of their publications and all their research behind a paywall. It's not always as simple as just telling people to put everything out there for free because there's a lot of, you know, lots of other considerations at place. And this is a very, you know, so globally entrenched uh, way of thinking around who gets to be an expert in a topic and what happens to that knowledge. Um, so the vision that my organization puts out is, is that um, knowledge should be freely shared that learning is best done with others and that education is a social good. And that those are the values that have really driven the work of peer to peer university since its inception as an idea back in 2008, which was, um, I should have said maybe five or six years before I joined. Um, to begin, um, our organization was really focused in helping universities build online learning communities. And so P2PU was founded at a time before there were you know, MOOCs, these massive open online courses before you know, Khan Academy, edX, Coursera, a lot of these sort of big global players have started to sort of think of um, learning as, you know, as sort of a very um, a widely available activity that can suit different people at different stages in their life. Um, so we were working with universities to think about how they could create online learning experiences that were collaborative, that were creative, that were engaging. Um, we were involved in building the first open badges standard, uh, you know, the credentialing for, you know, outside of formal education, wanting to recognize people for the work uh, that they've done. Um, and we also uh, were involved in building the uh, platform that supported these first uh, massive open online courses uh, in uh, 2012 or so. Um, I also just want to note, I do see some comments coming through. I'm going to not look at those at all uh, for the time being, um, but I certainly will come back to all of those uh, as, we, as we get back um, later uh, in the presentation. Um, so anyway, I joined the organization at a time that online courses uh, were really sort of taking off around 2012, 2013. And I really want to just sort of pause and note a little bit of terminology because 
I might be using different terms interchangeably. And I think it's important just to be clear about what the different, uh, different concepts are. Um, the first is being OER, which is an open educational resource. This is really um, sort of the gold standard of uh, being able to freely, not just share, but also revise and remix and retain, uh, keep something and, and, and make it what you want it to be. You know, often giving credit for, you know, to the original creator and this is, you know, Creative Commons as an organization has really emerged around concepts like OER to help people get credit for their work or, or be able to maintain some sort of legal authority saying things like, if I give this away for free, you can't go and charge money for it. So there's, a, you know, there's a whole world of, of licenses that are sort of centered around open educational resources. Um, and this is sort of the, you can sort of think of this as the content equivalent of like open source software for, for software. And so when P2PU, when we develop anything, if it's software, it's gonna carry an MIT open source software license. If it's content, whether that's an online course or a resource, it's always gonna be an OER, you know, it's always gonna be OER. But OER can take many forms. It doesn't have to be a full online course. You know, a blog post that has an instructions on how to do something can be OER. And I think that's one of the points that I wanna to make too, is that we should think more broadly about what a course is and what the, where we can go about trying to find what we need in order to learn together. Um, MOOCs are a sort of a term that seems to maybe be dying off, which is maybe a good thing. Um, but this is sort of that massive open online course that was popularized by Harvard and MIT and Stanford um, as you know, a place where thousands of people could come together and take a university course from around the world. There's a lot of great things that happen in MOOCs. Uh, they are also, I think, uh, were a bit ambitious in, in how they thought they could go about changing the world when these are still sort of effectively tools of universities that you know serve a very clear marketing purpose um, for the university. And, and, and indeed, we've seen things that um, were free and were open for a while have increased. I think the trend has been to lock these things down and close them off. Um, online course and online learning resource are really just general terms. But again, I want to make that distinction that the idea of a course or the idea of a scaffolded learning experience where a group of people are working through something together, the curriculum can sometimes form itself. And when we don't necessarily need to have a 16 week course that's created in advance for a group of people to successfully uh, work together. So I'll try to be using the words online course or learning resource to, you know, generally. Um, some organizations are really dogmatic about OER. Um, our perspective is we want people to be able to use things freely, whatever it is. And so if something has a copyright, but it's free to use personally, uh, in, in many cases, libraries spend lots of money to license uh, educational materials from things like lynda.com. In that case, if it's free to the learner, we want you to be able to use it. We're not, we don't think there's any moral high ground in sort of telling you, oh, well, that's not an open resource, so you shouldn't use it. Uh, we really want to just help participants and help learners get access to as many things as possible. That doesn't mean we don't have a, a position or a perspective on uh, spending lots of money to rent, uh, you know, this rental economy that, that exists around, um, you know, online learning databases. But, you know, from the perspective of learning circles, we really want to just help people get access to as much as they can. Um, so sort of in the spirit of online courses, Something that we were seeing all the time uh, or, you know, in 2013, 14, when I started this work was a saying something like anybody can learn anything anywhere for free. And this was you know, the sort of democratizing education slogan that um, in some ways is extremely empowering, uh, but in other ways I think is very also incomplete. Um, we run a lot of workshops with uh, groups, you know, library groups and community education groups around the world. And one of the things we like to do is really to try to interrogate this sentence and think about how we can make it a bit more accurate. And what we end up with is something, something like this. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just read this. Anybody who has had their various more essential needs met like childcare and their learning disabilities, who has the mental capacity to take on work, is curious, has access to technology and learning resources, can read and write, has digital literacy, they can learn anything that's accessible to them and not censored uh, by a government or a paywall, but recognizing that what they can learn is likely influenced by you know, dominant Western forms of knowledge production. And furthermore, that the knowledge that they're gaining is likely limited to theory um, because you know, the internet can't really teach you how to ride a bike. You sort of, you need to get on a bike at some point. They can learn these things anywhere they feel safe and have access to electricity, the internet or, or learning resources for free. 
except nothing in life is actually free. And, you know, it takes, even if it's just your time that you're dedicating or the commute that you have to get there or the trade-off of what you would have been doing otherwise, nothing's actually free. And so this, this is not as nice of a marketing slogan uh, for a, a online course provider, but I do think it's, it's a lot more honest about um, the things that everyone has to overcome uh, as an individual or in a group environment in order to learn together. And so on the one hand, this maybe feels overwhelming. I think, you know, it does, it feels overwhelming to me. But on the other hand, I think it's also quite liberating to recognize this because what this also means is that online courses, we don't work for courses. Courses work for us, right? Courses should really be helping us to formulate the questions that we want to ask, not be telling us the answers to everything that we have out there. Um, an, a, an online course, an online learning resource, no matter how good it is, is never going to solve your problems. Um, and I think that we don't need, you know, permission. It, 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 we don't need uh, to follow things exactly the way that they're created. Really, we want to try to build learning environments where it's very clear that the goals of the participants are far more important than, you know, the order or the type of learning that the people who put the course together thought this group should use. Um, in a sort of formal classroom environment, you might say that like the curriculum half the curriculum walks in with the students, right? The, like the lived experiences of the people who are part of the learning environment are as much a part of the curriculum as whatever the sort of state mandated learning objectives are or whatever whatever you have. Um, and so I think this is really where we try to get to with our, with our partners is recognizing that we always want online learning resources to be in service of the learning goals of the participants and never the other way around. And, you know, Justin talked about his schooling experience. You know, I also have always found myself to be a very curious person, but it often felt like curiosity wasn't necessarily enough in school if I wasn't doing it in a particular way. Um, and I think that, you know, even for me to sort of, I'm, I feel like I'm still realizing this myself after doing this work for eight years, because so often, you know, you see a fancy textbook, you see a nice online course with a fancy Harvard professor. And, you know, I sort of, feel deferential to that. And it's hard to remind myself that that professor doesn't know me. The authors of that textbook don't know me. Um, and what I get out of that is really up to me. Um, not up, to, not only up to me, up to the group of people I'm working with, which is where we're going with all of this is that, you know, a peer learning group is a, is a really great way to sort of recenter um, an online course or online learning resource. Um, before we get there though, I just wanna just call out that there's a lot we do like about online learning. Um, and that we're not trying to throw uh, the baby out with the bathwater, as you say. Um, and what I think MOOCs have done and what I think online learning in general has done, which is you know, a field that goes back a lot longer than just 10 years, um, is you know, first of all, the culture of remixing, um, you know, which is similar to sort of mixtape culture and music that sort of evolved in the 70s and 80s, which is that no single person gets to write the story for a particular topic or subject. and that someone might share something and you know, there's you know, a variety of tools that are available online that just make it a lot easier for somebody else to come and turn that into something that works for them. Um, you know, the idea of the commons and the open source is something again that certainly pre-existed the internet, um, but you know, there's a lot about um, internet culture that sort of supports this sort of contribu contributory methodology in which people are creating something greater than what they'd able, be able to create on their own by sharing their code, by sharing the resources that they're working on. Um, knowledge isn't static. You know, there's a lot of difference between updating blog posts and, and articles and courses versus waiting for the next edition of a textbook to come out. Um, there's so many different ways to learn online. Um, it's easy to sort of jump between a very linear framework where you're working towards a thing with something more modular where you're jumping around. Um, and then online learning, uh, just by virtue of, um, you know, the cost of fiber and electricity, as opposed to sending things around the world and, and through the post and printing paper, it's, you know, in theory, it's a, it should be easy to access and easy to share. And again, this is in theory, because we, you know, a lot of the same sort of barriers to entry that faced um, pre-internet learning, we're also facing uh, today. Um, when I joined Peer-to-Peer -peer University in 2014, or 20, yeah, around 2014, um, I think the question that we were asking ourselves as a, as a five-person nonprofit organization was, how do we take everything here that we like about the internet 
And how do we activate online learning along this same value system? How do we take all these great things around open source, the commons, remix and culture, you know, dynamic learning, and how do we create a learning environment that really not only rec uh, recognizes that, but really embraces that and, 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 and builds off of that. Um, and this is sort of what led us to the concept of learning circles. Um, and learning circles, just to be very you know, clear and straightforward about it, these are free groups of people meeting together, taking a course or working through some resources together um, with one person who sort of takes on the identity as the facilitator um, to convene that group who's uh, that facilitator is not necessarily a content expert. Um, we feel like this brings back a lot of the sort of things that get lost when talking about online learning sometimes, things like personality, relevance, empathy, flexibility, things that we think about maybe when we think of a great experience we had in person or a great experience we had with a teacher um, that sort of gets sort of weeded out when uh, we are we're participating in a number of different online learning environments. Um, I want to also just acknowledge that we did not invent the concept of learning in a circle. You know, this peer learning is probably older than the oldest classroom. I mean, probably it's probably millennia older than the first classroom, um, but we're really just trying to help support a set of software tools, a methodology, a course library, um, and a set of resources and a community really of practitioners who want to sort of think about learning circles as a tool for their organization. Um, since we started, we've now uh, supported more than 11,000 participants uh, meeting in 7,000 different meetings around the world. Um, we're really excited about sort of the the way that this work has spread very organically. And um, you know, we have lots of, lots of big goals and aims for, for you know, the next decade of this work. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit more specifically about the ins and outs of learning circles. Um, and then we can sort of move on to some of the bigger picture. Um, so I talk about learners and facilitators. There's no expert required. And in fact, we often find that it can be a lot more difficult for uh, somebody who is an expert in a topic to cultivate a peer learning environment because they are always going to be looked to as the as the expert. It's not impossible though, and I think it's really important. One of the most important things of any learning environment is that you are participating in something you're excited about. And so we do have lots of people who are really eager to share their knowledge and, and serve as sort of the content expert rather than an online course. But there's a lot of work involved to help think about how they can do that in a way that truly invites participation from the full group without sort of falling back into this dynamic where people are just looking for them, looking to them for permission really to learn what they want to learn. Um, group size varies. Generally, we think a good group size is between five and 15 uh, people. Um, these learning circles are meeting in a public space, uh, like a public library, like a community center or in a virtual space. So when we began learning circles, it was an exclusively in-person program really designed to help reach individuals who were not otherwise going to be participating in online learning. Um, for the last two and a half years, for you know, self-evident reasons, we have really developed an online practice where a number of learning circles are meeting um, online. And now we support both types of programs. Um, learning circles are a regular meeting. Um, we default to about two hours per week for six to eight weeks. Uh, the reason here is we wanted to create a program that feels more than just a workshop, but less than a semester of college. And we have found that six to eight weeks ends up feeling like a really nice, um, a really nice chunk of time where a group of people will be able to get their goal, you know, reach a concrete goal. They're not just going to get a brief introduction to something, um, but it's not so long that it feels really overwhelming at first. We have lots of groups who end up meeting, who fit, the learning circle finishes and they keep meeting every week for another year. Um, but to be upfront, we wanted to start this as a very concrete thing that if you participate for six to eight weeks, you will have gained a very concrete uh, goal because of that. And that's, you know, that's worth celebrating. Uh, and the final point to learn about a topic together. Um, and again, the thing that's important here is that they're learning the same thing. Uh, I think it's really beautiful when people come together for learn to learn the same thing for different reasons. Um, you know, we think, think of like public speaking learning circles where you have a few college students who are not native English speakers who are coming to become more confident doing speeches in English. You have um, some folks who have a, you know, are out of school and have a job 
and public speaking as part of their professional responsibilities. And so they're doing this as a professional development component. And then maybe there's some folks who are retired or older who are just really trying to do something fun in their community. Um, and it's really beautiful, I think, to bring together folks who are, you know, multi-generational, very different backgrounds who share in this instant, in this instance, a, a desire uh, to learn to become a better public speaker. Um, but it's important that that sort of goal is the same for the group. Um, but the reasons that they bring um, are not, are not, they, it's, they do not need to be the same at all. Um, each learning circle meeting um, has a few different components that are sort of coordinated by the facilitator. Again, I wanna note the facilitator is really a guide and not a, a, a teacher or expert. We think of like a party host as a really nice metaphor for thinking of a facilitator. It's someone who's gonna show up a little early to make sure the lights are on, to make sure the room's unlocked. Um, they recognize it in the first week or two. They're probably gonna be the one who needs to do a little bit more of the chatting uh, to help people feel comfortable. Because again, like it's, it's, it's normal to walk into any learning environment and sit facing the front of the room and wait for somebody to tell you what to do. Um, when we started this work, uh, our first partner library was Chicago Public Library. Um, and it's funny, you know, sometimes you enter a room and it, you feel like there's a front of the room, like based on where the window or the doors are. But there's this one room they were using for learning circles in Chicago that was just a perfectly symmetrical square. It had four, it had a wall, it had a door on all four sides, no windows. Um, and there's like no front to the room, but like, I don't know, it's just like, we're so ingrained to sort of sit facing the front that like everyone sort of figured out like, oh, there's an exit sign over one door that sort of seems like the front. So when they take their chairs, everyone faces that way. So that it takes a lot to sort of think about learning in a circle. And that's really one of the reasons we decided to call this program Learning Circles is because we are, it is so entrenched in our, in our mentality that when we are entering you know, when we're turning on learning, when we're going to learn something that, you know, we should be waiting to be told what we're learning uh, from the experts. So we do a lot of work with facilitators to help them create those conditions for folks to um, feel comfortable offering their perspective, speaking up, helping out with some of the chores and tasks. Um, we work, I've been talking about libraries a lot. We work primarily with public libraries. Uh, in North America, East Africa, and Europe, but it's not exclusively a library program by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and whether it's a librarian or some sort of other educator or volunteer, I, a learning circle works best when the, the, when the facilitator is working through the course as a participant as well. It's something that they wanna learn. Um, that's just you know gonna feel like a more engaging learning environment than sort of just coming to turn the lights on, check in on everybody. And, and generally a group of people do need two or three weeks to start to feel like they're um, you know, comfortable operating together. Um, the participants who we work with are mostly adults. So that's you know, 16 and older. Um, as I mentioned already, there's very different motivations for participation. We ask participants what they're trying to get out of a learning circle. And we feel like there's a very even split between um, professional development, uh, upskilling, um, you know, professional development for a current job versus I'm trying to get a job and I think this skill is going to help versus I'm in school and this is a supplemental education program versus just I'm here, I want to be part of the community, I want to meet my neighbors. And again, it's really nice, I think, to create learning environments where people are coming together for very different reasons. Um, as learning circles are, you know, were invented as a, as a in-person program, it's a really good introduction to online learning. And, and really this was sort of the audience who we were really trying to address in our first project was, you know, can we create an on-road to learning, to online learning where at the end of six weeks, people not only have, haven't only learned a thing, whether that's resume writing or public speaking or building a website, but they also feel more comfortable learning online so that they can go off and learn some things on their own or take another learning circle. And so the first pilot project that we worked on, um, you know, not only were we seeing, you know, like 80, 75 or 80% retention rates where many people were coming back week after week, but I think about well over half of the participants, this was their first time they'd ever done any sort of online learning. And so we're sort of like doing online learning without doing online learning. Like when we promote a learning circle, we're not saying come take an online course, we're saying, Come become a better public speaker. And oh, by the way, we're going to be using these resources on this website. It's called Coursera, but the course is from the University of Michigan. 
but you're at Chicago Public Library, but there's this organization called Peer to Peer University. You know, it's all, it's all sort of quite complicated if you sort of try to explain all the different parts. But really what we're trying to do is just help create environments where people can come and have a really meaningful learning experience for free. Um, public libraries and libraries in general, I wanted just to touch on quickly. This is Phoenix Public Library, my hometown library um, in this picture. Um, and I think, you know, I know public libraries have very different roles um, in different parts of the world. Uh, in the US, they are asked to do far too much, frankly. They are this sort of social net that holds a lot of this country together, um, where, you know, there should be a lot more money invested in, in, in you know, in healthcare and formal education and, and, you know, helping homelessness, you know, but public libraries are really there to really help anybody on the terms that they are coming to the library in. Uh, they're an absolutely vital and incredible uh, institution that has been extraordinarily challenged over the last two and a half years, um, but somehow manages, you know, to continue to be engaging and fun and welcoming and supportive. Um, but the educational values of a public library, I think, are actually far more aligned with peer learning than the educational values of a, of a university or, or of a college. And that's not to say there isn't wonderful learning uh, environments that happen in formal education. Um, there's a ton, obviously tons and tons of incredibly dedicated uh, university staff who, who really care about their students. But when you look at the sort of baseline values of, of what a university is versus what a library is, only one of those institutions truly has a commitment to access for all. And only one of those institutions really has a commitment to open-ended learning where when you walk into a library, they're not gonna tell you what you wanna learn. They're gonna ask you what you, they can help you find. Um, and that's really one of the reasons that in the United States, I think it's actually officially Cleveland Public Library's um, nickname, but a lot, of a lot of libraries adopt this slogan of being the people's university. And so for us here, the libraries were a really clear uh, partner to support peer learning environments. And in many cases, libraries were already doing things like learning circles well before, um, well before we uh, were involved. Um, I want to just quickly talk about the format of a learning circle. We think it's really important to have a common structure. Um, two sort of very different examples of communities that I think are relevant are Alcoholics Anonymous and CrossFit. Uh, those are two communities where you can go anywhere in the world to an AA meeting or a CrossFit gym, and you sort of know what to expect. It's going to feel very different. It's going to be different people. You're going to be working on a different thing, but you sort of know what you're getting into, and it's a methodology that's refined over time. And so with a learning circle, every single meeting, whether you're working in web design or, um, or sort of, you know, sort of tackling climate change, he's going to start with a, a short check-in activity, followed by a big chunk of coursework, followed by a group activity, and followed by a closing reflection. And so a lot of the work that we're doing at our organization is to help look at all of these different online courses and online learning resources that are out there that are relevant for our partners and helping them sort of massage those course materials into this sort of format. Um, on our website, we have a library right now of about six or 700 online learning resources that people have used for learning circles around the world. Uh, it's primarily in English, Spanish, German, and Portuguese. We have growing, um, growing libraries right now in uh, Polish and Finnish as well. Um, but anyone can add a resource. And when we see a, a resource get added to our database, we're going to look at it. We're going to reach out to you. We're going to help think about, you know, how we can sort of contextualize this into the learning circle format. Um, our goal is not to create a search engine of every single online course. There's already organizations who do that quite well, and that's not really what we're trying to, to do or what we're interested in. Our goal is to really try to curate a list of really reliable, good courses that are um, well suited to peer learning. And this is a, this is a, a course library that we are um, you know, sort of managing uh, and, and moderating on, on an ongoing basis. Um, just to say one, one, one more thing about sort of courses, so many online courses, just like you know, formal education is oriented towards this idea of the autodidactic, super motivated learner at home doing something by themselves. The sort of anybody can learn anything online for free sort of learner. Um, and learning circles are not like that. And so, really what the work that we're trying to do is, is, is sort of create these sort of guides and resources that supplement the courses that help a facilitator feel comfortable really transforming 
the framework of that course away from being something that somebody is expected to do at home alone into something that is really uh, creating a good group experience. So, you know, I think a very good follow-up question is what makes a good, what makes an online course work well for peer learning? What are the things to be looking for um, for a, 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 to create a high quality peer learning environment? And the answer is not, you know, um, web 3.0 and artificial intelligence all the time. You know, a lot of the times it's a lot more simple than that. Um, really trying to take a project-based approach over a theoretical approach. And again, this is as much for pedagogy as it is for recruiting participants and marketing. It's like saying, you know, learn HTML and CSS is not gonna be as compelling as build a website for your small business. And so thinking about projects as a framework that a group of people can work through a topic is a really, really helpful thing to be looking for. Um, when we work with course creators and people who are trying to contribute learning resources to uh, learning circles, we encourage them to be really personal and really upfront about their own perspective and their own biases instead of trying to appeal to this sort of false sense of objectivity uh, that doesn't exist. Um, it's a lot easier for a group of people to sort of make their own meaning from a learning experience when they understand who created the resource, why they created the resource, rather than presenting knowledge as this sort of static thing that sort of just gets put there that you need to be consuming. Um, we always talk about group discussion instead of user interaction. User interaction is um, you know, obviously like a very common uh, term in sort of human computer interaction and dynamics. Um, but I think interaction so often is sort of a not great proxy for group discussion. And, you know, having people fill out quizzes or sort of having dynamic learning content that, you know, it's like, if you choose this, then we'll feed you this way. If you choose this, we'll feed you the other way. That's still, you know, that's sort of this illusion of choice or this illusion of sort of personal, um, you know, being personalized. Um, and I think that, um, I, I forget who said it once, but I heard someone say like, I don't want personalized learning. I want personal learning. And I think like group discussion is a really nice way to cultivate a personal learning environment. Always trying to advocate for transparency over hierarchy. So we're very clear that when we help facilitators create supplemental resources for the online courses that they're using in learning circles, that they should feel comfortable sharing that with a participant. There shouldn't be some sort of answer key or some sort of teacher guide that's hidden away that the whole group doesn't have access to. Again, that's not to say everyone needs to care about the facilitator guide, but we just really want to create an environment where there isn't that sort of hidden you know, notebook where the teacher's just sort of taking notes and you wonder what they're writing because there's really no, no reason for that here. Um, we want to think about online courses and learning resources as, as connected rather than operating in a silo. So again, like this is a bit where the humility of online course design comes in, recognizing that you're not going to put every single thing in the world into a single course and better just to be really clear about what you do know and point to other things when you don't know. Um, and, and again, like one of the best things as an online course creator that you can do for a group of people is to show, help people learn how to leave the confines of the course to find answers that they're looking for that, aren't, that weren't questions that you could have predicted uh, they would ask. Um, always open access over closed. And for us, that includes not having logins. We put everything, every course we create, we put online open access. Um, it's just there that obviously we lose some insights into, how, you know, we obviously we have analytics, so we know how many people are accessing it. We're not allowed, we, you know, it, we lose out on being able to send people marketing emails because we don't always have their email addresses. But, you know, for folks who work with people who don't have, you know, the type of digital literacy that we all have to be here on a Zoom call, you'll know how overwhelming and what a barrier to entry a, a simple uh, login or password creation process can be. Um, and then finally, operating for lo low bandwidth over bells and whistles when possible. Uh, when you create a course, you don't necessarily know who's going to be using it or why they're going to be using it. And, you know, with the communities that we work with, if something is downloadable offline, if it's easy to translate, if you don't need really intense media, um, a 4K video in order to access, really get the spirit of the materials, your materials are going to be better used by more people around the, around the world. So I'll just very quickly want to just highlight a few things on our website. So p2pu.org, everything that I'm talking about really is freely available from our website. Um, this is a screenshot of our learn learning resources page where we host um, all the course resources. 
We also have about a dozen topic guides right now, which are introductions to popular topics and learning circle communities. You see here, anti-racism, business and entrepreneurship and climate change are the first three. Um, so this is a great place to go, whether you're running a learning circle or not, just to see what are some of the peer learning practices for taking on different topics and finding a lot of the courses that our community has, has put together. We have a knowledge base. Uh, this is sort of where we document our full methodology. Uh, this is really designed as really a place for facilitators to go to find tips and suggestions for creating a peer learning environment. It's where we have you know, flyers that you can make copies of to help promote your learning circle. Uh, you know, we have a, an extended database of different places. We like to look for courses. We have a guide on creating courses. All of this is accessible from our knowledge base. Um, we host a, events every single month. Uh, we try to stagger the time zones so that they work for people around the world. Um, but every month we have a facilitator call for people who are engaged in peer learning right now. And again, this is um, what I hope is becoming clear that we don't try to only just tell people to do peer learning, but we try to enact peer learning in the way that we work as a community. And so having a space that our community can come where we are the facilitators and they're the participants is a really, really helpful way to reinforce the values and, and help create environments where people are always learning and always getting new insights and different perspectives on the type of learning environments that they themselves wanna create. And then finally, we do build a number of open source software tools um, that you can sort of think of as like an open source alternative to like Meetup or, or Eventbrite or something like that that's really designed for learning circle facilitation. Um, it's, you know, it's not required to use our software tools to run a learning circle by any stretch of the imagination. If you do, you'll be able to more easily access um, feedback from other people who have used the same course that you're using. We're, we're gonna ask you a weekly reflection question as a facilitator every week and use that to really sort of um, build the agenda for future community calls. Um, so it's really just about a way for us to know what's going on so we can help you out. Um, but again, it's not, it's not required. Um, yeah, and so these are the sorts of things that we offer and we, and we build. Um, but the most important thing that we build and maintain is a community of practice. And this is a group of people um, from around the world uh, who are helping inform the new courses that we're finding, the software tools that we're building, in new improvements to the methodology. Um, and I think if I could sort of summarize P2PU's job in one sentence, it's that we want to make every certain learning circle better because of all the learning circles that came before it. And so really trying to figure out how do we learn from the groups that are meeting and share that wisdom and that knowledge and that insight and perspective with other audiences who haven't yet started their peer learning journey. I think the best way to measure for us whether we're reaching that goal is when we see communities finding novel problems that we couldn't have anticipated um, coming up with solutions to those problems and then solving them, sharing the feedback and getting, um, you know, getting people to come and, and take on their solutions. So when COVID started, um, Los Angeles Public Library really works a lot with folks who don't have computers at home. They started conference call learning circles. They wrote some documentation on how they would host a learning circle over the phone, shared that, and some other people started doing that as well. Um, in Kenya, where not everyone has a, you know, lots of folks don't have computers, but most everyone has a WhatsApp. They've started running learning circles through WhatsApp where they're meeting in person or only online or only on WhatsApp in some cases, but all the resources and materials, like the course again, is shared through a series of WhatsApp messages that people can download when they have Wi-Fi connection and then read offline at home. Um, in Cologne, Germany, uh, they got started with hybrid learning circles um, where some people who are comfortable coming into the library did, where others stayed at home. And that can create a really difficult dynamic where some people, you know, where you have some people at home, some people on the computer. I think they ended up getting one of those sort of like rotating lazy Susans that you might put, you know, condiments like hot sauce and, and things on to spin the laptop around. So whoever was talking could sort of see the whole room. And they shared the, that feedback with our community. Um, and then one other thing I loved in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, they really wanted people to still feel connected to the physical space of the library during the pandemic. So they did a number of laser cutting and 3D printing learning circles online, but then people could send their files over to the library. The library would print or laser cut those materials and people could come to the library and pick them up. So these are just a few examples of things that we had, you know, we didn't come up with these ideas, but we, create, we helped create the environment where people could play around, share these ideas, and now we've really helped other libraries and other community partners take on this work. 
Um, to sort of get to the final point uh, I want to be making right now, uh, it's that these community partnerships are all going to start um, with shared values. And this is where I think we can be thinking more generally outside of libraries, but thinking about nonprofits uh, more generally. Um, you know, for us, without open educational resources or peer learning, we wouldn't be in 90% of the places that we operate. Um, it's really been about creating these environments, being really clear about what our educational values are, and then going and trying to just put our work out there and see how people respond. And when Learning Circle started, it really was about just hosting a learning circle. So libraries said, we would like to host learning circles. And as I've mentioned, public libraries have been a natural partner, but not the only one. But what we've seen in the last few years is that partners are finding lots of new ways to be involved. You're creating courses for learning circles. And when I'm talking about partners now, I'm not just talking about public libraries. I'm talking about all sorts of nonprofit organizations who have said, hey, we want to share our expertise in the learning circle format. Can you help us create a course? Or hey, learning circles are working great for our, for our patrons or our, our community. We'd like to do this for staff training and create a staff uh, learning circle. Or we don't feel like we have good enough relationships with other organizations in the city. Maybe learning circles are a tool that we can use to better connect with other organizations in the city. Uh, so just briefly to just give a few concrete examples of this and how this has worked out. Um, some of you might be familiar uh, with the 1619 Project, which is a archive um, and resource that was published a few years ago in the US that sort of really was dealt to sort of tackle and, and discuss America's uh, history with slavery. Uh, a lot of US states have banned uh, this topic and are sort of going on a sort of censorship crusade right now. Uh, the Public Library in North Carolina in Charlotte said, we need to start running programs on this topic right now. But it's really, I mean, it's a, it's a huge topic and it's something that you know you might not feel comfortable facilitating if you're not an expert. So what we ended up doing was working with one person who felt well-versed in this topic and felt comfortable facilitating a learning circle. We worked with them, they really put, they took the lead to put together a facilitator guide that they could then share with other libraries. So the 1619 Project is a freely available resource um, that anyone can use, but it's not quite accessible if you don't feel really comfortable running if, for, for Anyone can like go through it on their own, but if you want to convene a group around it, it, it can feel quite intimidating. This facilitator guide helped library systems around the country start running this sort of program uh, without needing to sort of feel like they needed to have an expert there or someone who was, you know, had a PhD in, in American history um, or something like that. Uh, another thing, and Justin, you talked on this in the beginning, uh, New York University has a commitment to educating, not when I say public education, I mean educating the public. Uh, they've done some research on ethic, ethical artificial intelligence, and they really wanted to create a learning circle course that was really meant for the people of New York. So we worked with them to adapt their research into a five-week online course called We Are AI, and we worked with Queens Public Library to run that as a series of programs for teens and adults. It's still ongoing, um, but you know, you think you compare this to reading a white paper, having to pay to access a journal article, or maybe you see a video on YouTube from a conference you didn't go to. Creating these learning circle environments for to really engage with the research is an incredible way to get the public um, not just invested in your work, but able to it, it really just start shaping the world um, that you want to see. And in this case, NYU wants New Yorkers to be more informed about the implications of automated decision making. And we feel that learning circles have been a great way to do that. Um, I talked about building professional community. Um, a library, station, a library association in, in Rhode Island, which is a small state near between Boston and New York, um, they had been paying uh, consultants to come into Rhode Island to teach them things for professional development. And during the pandemic, they said, what if, we, what if we spent that money on us instead? What if we work with experts to develop course material in topics that our community cares about, and then we run those as small peer groups for people across the state? And we got academic librarians working with public librarians, working with school librarians, people and archivist librarians, people who weren't otherwise interacting with each other were having these peer groups together, which um, you know is really phenomenal. Um, and I think the final example I have is connecting different organizations. Um, we do work with a community college in the US called College Unbound, who's now offering free college credit for people who participate in learning circles. And this has been an incredible, and, and this is just you know, in the US for now, um, but this has been an incredible way for um, libraries to start offer, offering free college credit, which is something they're not able to do before, and for College Unbound to access new audiences of learners through the library who they wouldn't otherwise be reaching out to. Um, 
So we're really thrilled about all of these projects. Um, we've developed a number of resources uh, on our website to help others create courses because we do see the Learning Circle course as a sort of glue that's really pulling different communities together. I've mentioned already, I think, the course creation guide, which is in our knowledge base, which is just a series of practices and principles for how to develop a free online course that works well for learning circles. I've also mentioned facilitator guides, which are these lightweight templates um, that are helped to take an, on, an existing online course or archive and turn it into a learning circle. We also have a open source software tool called Course in a Box, which is like an online course builder um, that is, you know, there and has been around for, uh, for a long time. And I'm happy to share more about these resources in the future. Um, so we've built a number of courses. We're really excited about all that work. Um, and I think in closing, I wanna just sort of put forward the question, you know, what if your organization, what if your nonprofit was the facilitator of a peer learning network? And regardless of what field you're in, you know, I, I would encourage you all to think a little bit about that. And I really look forward to the discussion where we can talk more about this. Um, because again, it's for us, it's, it's not only that we wanna help people run peer learning in a vacuum, it's just that we want to think about peer learning and open educational resources as the way that we do our work. And in that way, we're able to sort of really be, um, I think, held accountable to our own values. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what folks think about that. Um, I do have my email address here. I'll put it in the chat. And again, I want to just thank you all for giving me the time to come speak with you. Um, I hope to visit uh, your, your beautiful country sometime and, and, and really look forward to learning more about um, uh, what you all have to think about this. So with that, I will um, pass it on to Zul, I think. Thank you so much, Griff. There's so much I, I wanted to uh, kind of reflect on, but just for now, uh, if anyone here is interested, I noticed that there was a learning about learning circles course, and if anybody wanted to facilitate that, I would be glad to participate in learning circles, to learn about learning circles. Um, but for now, let's go to uh, Mr. Zulkifi Amin. He's the head of uh, adults and senior services from the National Library Board. Um, over to you, Zul. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zul here. And just let me get the slides uh, sl started. Okay, all right. I hope everybody can see the slides. Uh, so just let, let me just give an introduction to myself again. Uh, my name is uh, Zuki Flee. I'm the head for adult uh, services. So when we talk about adults here, it really uh, talks a lot about uh, adults age 18 and above. And um, my role in the National Library Board is a pretty uh, unique. I don't really have a specific role, but I prototype uh, new services, new programs, uh, design new libraries um, uh, for island-wide. Uh, our libraries are often changing. Uh, I craft new strategies and directions for the adults uh, learning uh, in Singapore as, uh, as well. So um, uh, when I was presented with the idea of uh, le learning communities or learning circles or interest groups as uh, how they call it uh, in, different, uh, uh, in different ways, right? Uh, I was very interested to share because it was a very timely period. Um, if you do check our National Library Board website, um, National Library Board just started a, on a journey. It's called a Library and Archives Blueprint 25, a roadmap uh, that will lead us towards uh, changing how libraries function, how we uh, change the way uh, learning is in Singapore. And one of the key pillars that was highlighted um, was the, the, the need for us to empower our learning communities in NLB. Um, and this has actually gone beyond in NLB. Um, I just got news recently that, I, uh, that we will be expanding towards reaching out to learning communities outside NLB as well. And uh, so this, this presentation came a very timely period uh, because of two reasons. One is, uh, is because we are always looking out for partners uh, to make the library as a, a, a platform for learning communities to come together, right? And number two, is uh, it came at a timely period as well is because we are out on a on a really on a mission uh, and the key word with, with my presentation is all going to be about is about empowering learning communities and uh, learning communities um, it's a little like businesses as well uh, it's very easy to start learning communities um, anybody can start a learning community but sustaining a learning community is one of the most difficult things uh, to do um, we have observed uh, um, over the years that uh, learning communities, they do develop fast, but they also die off fast as well. 
due to a couple of reasons, all right, uh, many reasons, either uh, facilitators burn out or um, participation uh, has just died down, all right. So today's presentation will also look into strategies that NLB has taken, all right, to kind of like um, explore how can we empower our learning communities, such a very heavy word, empowered, and the strategy, uh, the five-pronged strategy that we have taken to ensure that learning communities really grow, mature, and even um, uh, proliferate themselves. So to start off, uh, I think uh, Griefs kind of shared a little bit about what learning communities are about. Uh, and I think there's no clear definition. So NLB, we do have a little bit of a loose definition that we have that you can see there on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, the keywords really there is about common interests. Learning communities kind of bring people with common interests uh, together. Uh, and there's a form of interaction, learning, and uh, uh, bonding between members. And um, everybody kind of shares their knowledge together, uh, even resources as well. So it kind of, sort of like, uh, I, I think this phrase here kind of like sums up a little bit of what, what the presentation was earlier. Uh, a lot, there's this very open sharing. And I'll share more details about the impact of this uh, towards the members and the library as well. Uh, in NLB, we, we, we do have two types of uh, learning communities, right? Uh, one is known as interest groups. So interest groups are really people uh, who come together because they have a common topic of interest. Uh, either it's a hobby base, uh, non-fiction, it could be even about nature, right? Um, I'll show one some examples later. Uh, but being the fact that we are from uh, the library, uh, the reading clubs or the book clubs form the monster share of our learning communities. And uh, a lot of them are focused on reading. Right, and um, you'll be very surprised at some how some of these uh, reading clubs have developed to be so established that um, they they run literally like a company themselves. Uh, it's quite scary in one way, but also enlightening on the uh, on the other end of the spectrum as well. Which I'll share some examples as well. So if, today I'm also going to share with you the potential of what learning communities can deliver to the community at large as well as to how to the extent of which they can really establish themselves uh, within the library. All right, um, okay. All right, so um, the key questions is, uh, why are learning communities so important to libraries, right? Um, and we, we scoped our learning communities uh, uh, from the perspective of volunteers for the library. Uh, many of our learning community facilitators are uh, actually volunteers for the library, they are not paid. And most learning communities do not uh, run on a very profit. Uh, they don't run on a profit. And uh, many are based on, a, I call it a potluck of knowledge and as well as potluck of resources as well. Um, so how do we develop that learning communities in NLB? Most of them start off as volunteers. They attend our NLB programs and they meet like-minded people during these programs. It could be a one-on-one program all the way to even to an expert level program. Uh, many of them become very inspired uh, to either contribute or to learn more. So there's two portions to, to, to this uh, learning thing. Um, one is really to contribute and one is really to, to participate even more, to get it deeper into the skills itself. And learning communities kind of give that opportunity for people. Um, you attend a one-on-one -on -one program and you need to explore, am I ready to, 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 to learn a little bit more? And learning communities give that kind of platform where you can go in Right, and uh, be able to have conversations with people from all levels of, uh, of no, uh, pre-knowledge, from beginners to intermediate to expert. And that kind of gives you an idea about, hey, is this something for me? And many of our uh, uh, participants and volunteers, they, they, they come into these learning communities with that kind of initial uh, entry point. You know, they are not too sure whether um, they want to contribute or they are not too sure whether they want to learn something more. And learning communities provide as a midpoint, or a, I call it a, a halfway point as well. So it, when you talk about the learning pathway here, uh, learning communities becomes a very important um, uh, uh, incremental learning, right? For many of our participants as well as our volunteers and our contributors to learning communities, they attend a one-on-one -on -one program and then they go to the learning community. They learn a little bit more. They, 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 they have discussions with um, the other participants. And they, 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 uh, when the learning community ends, they attend a 102 program or they continue their 101 program. And then they meet again at the learning communities. And there's, a, there's this form of very enriching uh, learning experience. right? And um, what these learning communities do as well as they develop and they become more established, if you see the point number three on the left that 
is that um, learning communities contribute back to NLB with the knowledge gained through they conducting the programs or they provide content, content and expertise. So in a way, right, right. Um, the best way of learning, uh, I, I always believe the best way of learning or the best way to, to know whether you have learned is to actually share, right? And uh, what we are trying to do is that um, not only to share within the members of the learning community, but really to share outside the learning community to the community at, uh, at large. And this has um, uh, benefited, right? Uh, uh, create a kind of a learning ecosystem and a, a special relationship between NLB learning communities and volunteers as well. So to, to sum up, right, the, the three key benefits of learning communities is really uh, what we do is that we, we realize that learning communities really seek learning advocates. Um, the, the, the experts within the learning communities um, help to pull along the people who are beginners, all right? Uh, there's a form of sharing that is very, uh, very uh, informal, all right, uh, very organic. Right, and uh, it kind of develops more learning advocates uh, for, for the library and the community as well. Um, there's this sense of uh, joy of learning. Um, uh, there's this phrase that's been thrown a lot, a lot about, uh, about within the library community. How do we bring joy to learning? And we realize that learning communities uh, brings a very elevated uh, joy to learning, uh, not only through the peer-to-peer -peer sharing, uh, which results in a very sustained and self-driven learning, um, there's this uh, thing that is very wonderful because everybody learns at their own time and own, own pace. And, and it really opens up to a lot of mistakes and experimentation. Uh, learning communities um, take responsibility of what they want to learn, uh, the pace at which they learn. And uh, there's always this uh, natural relationship where if somebody is left behind, right? Um, right we, uh, somebody, were, were the, the experts in the group, will help along uh, the beginners in the group to kind of blend themselves or ingrain themselves into the learning community itself. Um, there's a lot of meaningful uh, outcomes from it, right? And uh, there's this thing about freedom to express uh, ideas, challenges, and uh, tacit knowledge because uh, learning communities tend to bring regular members together. And there's this uh, comfortable relationship that is created uh, as time goes by. And from there, there seems to be uh, there, there is a strong bond, bond between members that allows freedom to express uh, thoughts and ideas and opinions, even if it differs from uh, from one another, and it makes the learning very enriching. Um, last but not least, is uh, beyond just learning, we we realize that um, learning communities they function really as a family, uh, and really the established ones. Uh, there's this strong social support network and this was really observed during the COVID pandemic period where um, when a lot of learning communities were unable to meet during uh, physically at the library, uh, during the Zoom meetings that they pivoted themselves to, uh, there was this check-in, natural check-in about how are you doing, I think Grief mentioned it at the earlier part, how are you doing, uh, are you, uh, you know, uh, taking care of yourself or your wellness, and uh, there's this sense of like responsibility and ownership of the welfare of each other. Uh, and, and that goes way beyond the learning community sessions itself. So it becomes a very powerful uh, family uh, uh, environment that they have. So uh, just to give you some examples of learning communities, um, NLB is home to over 90 learning communities. Uh, uh, and this is the only ones that we kind of like really monitor. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, learning communities that exist within NLB spaces uh, that slip through our fingers, meaning that they use the library as a, as a space to meet up uh, without our knowledge, but and that's fine uh, as long as, uh, as the topic, topics are kosher. But uh, we do manage about 19, 90 learning communities and this is growing uh, every single day since we started our Lab25 uh, initiative. Um, it covers uh, areas such as careers. Um, uh, I, I think we, we talk a lot about peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning in students' context. Uh, we do have one here, which is uh, called the ACCA uh, Learning Community, where graduates from the ACCA um, uh, accountants, they come, uh, they come to re uh, provide assistance to students taking the modules. Uh, and that has helped uh, create a very uh, positive environment for the students as well. Um, we do have a learning day, uh, learning community, which is quite interesting as well. Uh, this is a very loose, uh, I call it a very loosely defined learning community where uh, members, they meet weekly, all right, to share a useful knowledge and skills. So um, we have had people coming uh, on a particular week and they have three uh, people sharing about uh, a certain topic. And I remember the last, uh, on last week, the sharing was on how to cook a good steak uh, at home. Uh, so there, there's some of the topics that they do cover there as well. 
uh, our digital learning communities are uh, one of the most popular ones uh, 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 in the library, right? Uh, particularly because of the fact that we have the Make IT uh, workshop uh, that, that exists in the, li uh, in the library. So, um, so one of the things that we do with a digital library, which I'll share, uh, digital learning communities, which I'll share later, is that many of these uh, communities, they come together uh, not only to meet weekly, but also to create projects uh, or to share their knowledge to benefit the community at large. So you can see the Pi and Python is one example where they actually learn coding. So people come together and they have people who are beginners in coding, people who are experts in coding, and they create simple projects together like a burglar, uh, burglar alarm or a field medication box reminder where every time they open and they close it, uh, it reminds that if they've taken the vitamins for the day or for the week. Um, yep. Uh, as, uh, and one example I will share very strongly later is the chatbot LC, uh, which is about over 200 members, uh, quite an interesting group, uh, which they, they create chatbots, uh, which will benefit the community at large. Um, on the arts front, uh, we do have a, a arts learning communities, actually it forms the second biggest group of learning communities within NLB, right? Um, and um, one of the key things that they, they like to do as well is to do showcases at the library as well and the community at large. Uh, one of the ones or one of, I would like to really point out is our uh, ukulele uh, uh, learning community, right? Uh, this is an example of a learning community that uh, was so established that they created offshoots of themselves at two other uh, libraries as well. Uh, as well. So um, it became the group got too big that it was uh, near impossible to have everybody have the same uh, experience of learning ukulele together or creating concerts and songs together that they decided to create offshoots themselves at two other regional libraries. Um, so, and they, they are often performing at uh, during library launches and uh, library events as well. Um, we have others like reading, all right? Of course, uh, reading clubs form the biggest number of learning communities in NLB. And in NLB as well, we do have children reading clubs as well. Um, and one thing I'd like to highlight is that not all learning communities are perpetual or they last forever. There are learning communities that, uh, that, that pops up seasonal. Um, so we have learning communities that pops up only during the school holidays. And the children then uh, 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 moves on, uh, and and you know during the busy period, uh, exams and all that, it, ha uh, it happens. And then during the school holidays, they come back again. The same group of people come back, come back again. So this is something that we see a lot in children's reading club. Um, the one that I would like to point out uh, about our reading club is our bottom left club, which is the taxi sifu club. So for those for those who are not sure what does the word sifu means, is the masters club. So it's like a teachers club. So these are really um, uh, taxi drivers who meet on a monthly basis, all right, uh, to 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 talk uh, to discuss about some of the books that they have read for the uh, for the month. Uh, they meet once uh, once a month and sometimes once every two weeks. So you can imagine um, the library and then the car park is just filled with uh, filled with uh, taxi drivers who who have to park their car at the car parks and then they make their way to the library. Now this club has been in existence for more than ten years. And they are so well established that they actually have an executive committee with a chairman, right, and even a treasurer as well. Uh, and it really goes to show the extent of which uh, how established learning communities can really develop themselves, and it becomes very uh, everybody becomes very invested into the club itself that they have created this uh, exec executive committee. Uh, and it shows how impactful uh, such clubs can be. Uh, the reason why I, I, I do fear for clubs like this is because they become so well established that um, sometimes when I sit in for clubs like this, um, I do feel a little left out, um, which is I think is something that the library uh, has to play a role in ensuring that they integrate themselves with the club. But this is a very well established club, which is, requires very little to no intervention from the library itself, other than the fact that we provide space, uh, space and publicity for them. All right. So as I mentioned earlier about the library and archives blueprint, uh, we have started this journey uh, where we have four pillars. And if you look at um, uh, the, the, the description within the pillars itself, uh, learning communities fits in most of these uh, pillars. You know, uh, creating lifelong learners, um, creation of Singapore stories um, through our learning communities as well, to bridge the gaps in learning as well, to ensure that everybody, uh, no one is left behind uh, in learning, right? And learning communities actually represents a very, very lucrative uh, platform. It is free 
uh, everybody is open to allowing anybody who's interested. It doesn't matter what background you are, what educational background you are. You have the opportunity to learn or contribute back uh, to the community or within the learning community itself, uh, no matter what prior knowledge or pre-knowledge you have. right? Um, so this is something that was very important in our Lab 25, empowering our learning communities. So you, uh, and as you can see, one of the key things that we have decided to take embark on, uh, for under, especially under the learning marketplace for um, Lab 25, was the fact that we have uh, six topics uh, that we decided to focus, uh, especially for adults, and that's digital career, sustainability, reading, arts, and wellness. Um, these six topics were chosen uh, because of the of a national uh, um, agenda of uh, the national needs, all right, needs of the community within Singapore. Uh, what is priority with if, if our uh, uh, partner agencies as well, and as well as uh, based on the feedback that we got from uh, our patrons as well. So these six uh, learning frameworks, as you can, uh, if you re you remember what I shared earlier, many of the learning clubs they uh, they are associated themselves with some one of these uh, learning frameworks, one or two of these learning frameworks, right? And this is something that drives us forward in being very strategic with working with certain partners major partners in seeding new learning communities, which I will share after this. So uh, in, in, our, in empowering learning communities, we came up with five uh, strategies here. Um, recruit, retain, recognize, reinvent, and re-network. Um, as I said, uh, mentioned earlier, it's very easy for us to start a learning community. It's very easy to seed a learning community, but uh, it is quite a difficult one to, to sustain uh, learning communities. And we have seen learning communities that have a lot of potential, but they died off uh, due to one reason or another. So based on these observations, uh, we came up with these five strategies. Uh, the first one, to ensure that the library becomes a very attractive platform uh, to set up learning communities, um, uh, which I will share later some of the, some, some of the deliverables. Um, how can we really make learning communities uh, not only survive, which is the first phase of most learning communities, or, uh, and, but also to mature, establish themselves, which I showed some examples earlier, but most importantly, to be able to see if they can grow, uh, grow not only in terms of the number of members, but also be able to proliferate uh, by building new learning advocates within their learning communities and then create offshoots learning communities for themselves. Um, um, doing some uh, to recognize their appreciation. Uh, just a little point on this, right? Um, quite a funny, uh, funny story I like to share. Um, uh, when we first started on this journey, right, we thought that learning, learning communities facilitators would be uh, wanting things like, for example, certificates or uh, reimbursement of some sort for, for their travels or a, a meal voucher. Uh, and when we did the survey, um, surprisingly, uh, many of them didn't want that. Uh, they, 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 they just told us that, you know, I, I'm just happy if you give me a cookie of, uh, once in a while, you drop by and drop me a cookie uh, just to have a snack. But other than that, I really don't need anything. And it really goes to show the essence of what learning communities are. They are they're not out to gain, to have any personal gain. Uh, they are not out to, to make any monetary gains for themselves as well. They are just out there really to, to share what they, they want, all right? and they, they are not really expecting anything. And the, 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 the thing that we realized uh, most that the feedback that we got from many of the facilitators and members is that show, uh, give us a chance to share our knowledge, help us to share our knowledge to the community. That is how you can show our appreciation uh, to learning communities, which, which kind of stunted us, but it kind of got us uh, rethinking about the uh, door, huh? no one around. communities. Yeah, you, um, you have got any... Right, uh, another thing is that we like to do... Uh, we wanted to do as well is that we wanted to reach out uh, and develop learning communities beyond just physical ones. Um, if you have noticed, all right, um, there are a lot of um, learning communities that kind of organically create, created themselves. Uh, I'll use one very extreme example. Um, uh, believe it or not, lunchtime pantries are actually a good place for learning communities to develop. You'll find that um, people meet during lunch, all right, and then they talk about whatever topic of interest of common, like uh, men, it could be about, especially men around Singapore, especially with the English Premier League starting in about you know, on Saturday. Let's talk of the town. And they start talking about it until the season ends, uh, every time they meet for lunch. Believe it or not, that is a form of learning community. There's a common interest, they meet regularly. Um, so so um, the, 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 the definition of learning community 
is really beyond what we really think, where we meet people, where people come together in a room and they sit together and they learn off each other. But learning has become more organic than that. You know, you don't need a fixed time and space. And I'll show you some examples later of how NLB has kind of like uh, reached out to some learning communities that is beyond just physical learning communities. And last but not least, the re-network where uh, we wanted to see how learning communities can network. Uh, we, saw, uh, we saw a lot of learning communities that are very similar to each other or somewhat similar, uh, but, and they, they could do well by coming together to do some form of best practices sharing, resource sharing, as well as even sharing of their members as well in terms of expertise uh, of, uh, of knowledge. All right, give me a moment. Okay, so the first step we wanted to do was recruit. And um, the, the first thing we wanted to do was to create a strategic partnership to seed uh, new learning communities. And uh, this is a very simple process. Uh, it means, it, uh, it, uh, some people, when they read it, they say, oh, duh, this is quite uh, straightforward. But uh, it's really a very strategic uh, approach where we firstly identify key partners that is relevant to our six learning frameworks. And then uh, we explore with these partners to, to potentially see new learning com communities. And we make sure that the outcomes of the learning communities meet both the partners' uh, needs as well. From NLB's point of view, uh, how can these members of this uh, learning community enrich and learn together? From the partners' point of view, how can they uh, how can it meet some of the uh, these outcomes? So, for example, like a sustainability uh, outcome, how can the members actually uh, be more aware, all right, of uh, some some of the sustainability uh, uh, topics related to the agency itself? Um, also, to reach out to untapped learning communities outside NLB, and how partners and us uh, can share resources, all right, to support to ensure that these learning communities thrive. So one of the key things that I would like to point out as well is that the library cannot survive alone, right? Uh, whether it's programs or any projects that we approach, uh, that we do embark on. But uh, really, we work very closely with many of the partners that we, um, uh, we touch base with. So these are some, some examples of major partners that we have worked with or we are working with actually with most of them, right? Um, uh, to reach out to learning communities as well as to see learning communities. You will find that uh, we have private organizations, uh, government agencies, even uh, agencies that are international level, um, even schools, um, uh, IHLs as well. Uh, but a key point that I like to say is that many of these partners uh, generally see the vision of learning communities and how learning communities can benefit them, right? And this common uh, uh, understanding that helps to develop the learning communities as well. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do when we, we uh, wanted to recruit uh, or seed new learning communities was to create this dedicated learning communities portal. Uh, I'll put it in the chat later after the presentation, right? Uh, but LearnX, uh, if you Google NLB LearnX communities, you'll find that there's a dedicated portal where we, we list down the, 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 a directory of learning communities. Um, how can, they, how can uh, anyone start a learning community uh, in general, not only within NLB, and how uh, actually even things like, for example, uh, basic etiquette in attending uh, learning communities. Um, and these are some of the things that we share in our portal as well. Uh, and that, that's where you can go as well to see the full list of uh, NLB's uh, learning communities across the, uh, the learning frameworks, which I shared earlier. So you can see some of these EDMs that we have on our website. And also we do send it out to anybody who's interested in uh, starting a learning community or even to join a learning community as well. Um, you can see, um, how uh, some little guidelines and some uh, approaches you can take to start a learning community. You know, um, as I mentioned, getting started is quite simple, but uh, that's where the library comes in to help build the community itself. Uh, not only to provide space, uh, to provide support uh, in terms of how to run. Um, some of the facilitators do feedback to us that they need uh, help in developing themselves as a facilitator as well. Um, you'll be very surprised that there are people uh, who are introverts who do wish to start learning communities. Uh, it is a personal journey for them to actually overcome their introvertness uh, uh, to, to share their knowledge as well. And uh, this is where the library comes in to help them as well. Um, getting the word out, the publicity and the resources to grow as well. So you can see from that little EDM that we sent out, um, we, do, we didn't want to send out a too detailed one, uh, not to scare, just not to scare off uh, any potential uh, people who would like to start a learning community. Um, the other thing is that to retain learning communities as well, uh, what, the key uh, thing that was very important is retaining them, making them survive, mature, and grow. And one of the key things we do is that we provide them a resource support. Um, 
which is a very, uh, uh, I would say a small token sum of $350 per year. Uh, and many of these learning, uh, I'll, let me uh, digress by not saying the word many, but some of the learning communities have uh, used this $350 um, to, to kind of help them with um, buying of resources to help maintain their their learning community. Uh, it could be, you know, like our ukulele club use it to maintain the, their equipment. Our book clubs use it to um, to buy uh, highlighters to highlight the books on their on their personal books, some of the key points, things like that. Um, but this is a very surprising observation. Uh, what we realize is that many learning communities do not want to, to redeem that $350. Uh, this again came as a shock for us. And when we asked them uh, the reason why, uh, the main reason give, given to us was that they are just happy um, being potluck in, in using the potluck uh, approach in bringing their resources together. And there's this form of satisfaction that they, they get from bringing, doing that uh, itself. So some of these little quirky uh, information that, uh, and observations that we have. Um, the other thing is that the skill support is a, is a key thing that uh, we are embarking and we have already embarked on. Really a lot of uh, to do with the facilitators themselves. Um, facilitation skills, handling difficult conversations, um, even making our learning communities uh, PWD friendly. Uh, how do you interact uh, with PWDs, uh, participants, people with disabilities? How can you, um, for example, change your content or resources to make it uh, P, uh, people with disabilities uh, uh, friendly as well? Uh, everything from PowerPoint captions and things like that. Um, so these are some of the things that we, are, uh, we have embarked on to upskill our facilitators. And uh, they really appreciate that because um, they realize that it's something as a personal development for themselves as well. And the, other, the third thing is really the one that we always want of our learning communities to, to be able to grow, all right, and, uh, uh, and to groom new facilitators as well. So this is just a snapshot of some of the little um, programs that our, uh, our facilitators attend. You know, they, they, they go through things like, for example, basic videography, um, cinematography skills. Um, sure, if you look at the word sure, there is a, is a, is a program that we created um, to ensure that the information that our facilitators take, uh, the resources they create, comes from uh, legit or reliable uh, sources, right? Um, yeah, with a lot of information out there that can be very discerning and uh, untrue. Um, they, they also have uh, special reservations for some of the programs that we have at the library. Some of the A-listers programs, uh, they will be given priority to sign up, right? And we have even have professional trainings as well. As you can see, everything for even first aid as well, um, professional voice recording, creating podcasts. Many of these skills are things that learning communities actually want to be to, to enhance their learning com community experience and part of their what we call community showcases and projects, which I will share later. So another thing that we do, uh, this is another EDM that we do send out to a lot of our facilitators, excuse me, uh, about enhancing things like their leadership skills, um, technology as well. Many of the learning communities uh, have decided to pivot themselves towards um, uh, technology, right? With the pandemic, uh, as well as now COVID going around. Uh, many of our seniors uh, learning communities have decided to take this option to ensure that safe is safe environment for everybody when they meet up. Um, and then the funds as well on the right hand side, as you can see a little EDM there uh, to, to explain the, the, what can the funds be used for. All right. So uh, another uh, portion is the recognize. How do we recognize uh, and appreciate our learning communities? And this was again a, a very uh, surprising point. You know, we wanted to do big bash parties. We wanted to create, uh, send them birthday cakes and stuff like that. But the, the thing is that they didn't want any of that. And it was a very uh, hard stance. You know, uh, we, we just don't want any of this just give us an opportunity to share our knowledge because we feel satisfied from doing that. So, you know, the best, like I said, the best way to, to know whether you share, you know something is actually to share it with somebody. And learning communities get very excited when we, we propose certain ideas of being able to share uh, their knowledge to the community at large through showcases. So one example I will show you is our Comics X Nature uh, project. Which is which is was by our comics uh, learning community. So we have a learning community that comes together to create comic panels, and um, they uh, they do feedback to each other. Uh, the members feedback to each other about the work, uh, about the penciling, or even the plot, uh, story plot, and things like that. So we decided as part of the opening of the new Chochukam Public Library, which was which is a very sustainably themed library. Uh, which, by the way, was awarded two days ago, the one of the best uh, green library uh, in the world. 
uh, which I'm uh, proud to announce, all right, um, they, we decided to create a series of comics, all right, uh, we approached these uh, comics and said, you know, hey, guys, uh, Cha Chukang is opening and, you know, how about creating some comics that is related to uh, sustainability, and these are some of the snapshots that they, they created here, uh, very easy to read, very simple, that is able to reach out to the audiences, so we did a print and it's available on e format as well. If you uh, go and visit uh, the link, which I'll share with you later, you can see some of these works. Um, the one that I mentioned earlier, the chatbot learning community, uh, is an amazing learning community, which has um, ballooned, uh, I'm tempted to say it, out of control, but uh, they have ballooned themselves well. And this is a, a co collaboration between uh, NLB and a private uh, company called AI for Impact, uh, which looks into AI technology. And what they do is that uh, we decided to bring people who have no prior knowledge to chatbot. They learn about the chatbot technology and they create projects out of that that helps to benefit the community. And we share this chatbot uh, with the community at large. Uh, we have had about three runs of this. Um, so each run, they, they, they will have uh, the, the members will come together and then they will learn chatbot. And then um, what they will do is that they will create projects uh, and then they will help each other to make sure that the projects uh, becomes into fruition. And um, what has happened is that we have uh, had over more than 50 uh, chatbots that have been created. Um, and it covers all kinds of topics from math, uh, reading recommendations. Uh, we even had one where uh, by uh, just by input, uh, if you input the item that you have, it will tell you how to recycle, where to recycle, and if the item can be recycled or not. Um, so the good thing about this chat, uh, this uh, learning community is that it has kind of morphed itself into a Telegram group, uh, where the, the Telegram group has just seems to be uh, growing and growing and growing with the, the number of members uh, growing. And they, the, what they happen is that the Telegram group has now become a learning community of itself, where people share knowledge with each other and they share resources with one another as well, which will bring me to the point later about the different types of learning community that do exist, which people don't realize that they do. Uh, this is another Zine Club. Um, uh, many of you may not be, be aware of what Zines are all about, but Zines are really small little personalized magazines uh, of some sort. And they do not have any ISBN or ISSNs created by uh, uh, anyone out there. Um, there is a very, uh, one of the um, uh, famous uh, Zines that I know is a very, uh, uh, on a very uh, funny topic, which is on um, Toast, you know, the one where you, you make the bread, toasted bread. So this person created a zine on toast, uh, just a toast machine. And he sends out every month a, a, a zine on toast. And he has actually has a very strong following on that. What he does is that he hands drawn his, uh, his zines, he will photocopy it, and he will mail it to every uh, members out there around the world. So zines are like that. They are very, very, uh, tend to be very personal topics, which reaches out to very personal uh, groups of people. And uh, we wanted to revive this art of zine making. So there's an LC was created, right? And the LC uh, does uh, periodically exhibitions uh, to showcase their zines, as well as to get members of the public to, to kind of just sit down and uh, um, uh, join them, right? Uh, in an open table, right? Uh, to create their own uh, zines. Um, so learning, learning uh, communities, right? Um, they, they actually, they exist beyond NLB spaces as well. Uh, and may, some, many of these uh, learning communities exist uh, online as well. So for example, one of the groups that uh, we have is known as a Digital Art Club, right? Uh, it's an interest group that focuses on art, specifically on mobile devices like iPads, tablets, and even uh, mobile phones as well. Uh, and what happened was that during the, the pandemic, right, the, the, they couldn't meet together again to share. So they had to pivot online to conduct sharing sessions on Zoom. They created a Facebook page for themselves uh, to, allow of, to allow feedback or works done. Right? And uh, what NLB has supported was that uh, these learning communities during the pandemic is to continue running online. Um, so many of the learning communities have kind of pivoted online as well. And some of them have decided to remain online as well, uh, which is not such a bad idea because it has actually um, widened the audience uh, catchment for their members as well. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, Facebook communities, you, you find that there are many Facebook communities that exist. Um, I'm a personal member of a, a horror movies uh, Facebook group, and, we, we, and, and there are actually talks and resources being shared by members of, the, of that group as well. Um, the, uh, one of the ones that are very popular in Singapore are uh, Facebook groups like Urban Farming and um, 
um, hydroponics planting at home. Uh, these are things that, uh, so these are groups that NLB are, are reaching out to as well. And how do we plug ourselves into these groups? Is that we not only do we share our resources within these groups, all right, but also we invite these groups back to the library, all right, to share their knowledge or their expertise, right, to move out from that learning group to beyond to be able to contribute back to the community as well. Hi, Zul. So sorry to interrupt, but um, yep. we have about 25 minutes left. I was hoping we could. Uh, the, okay. the examples are fascinating, but we could wrap up soonish, then we can get to a discussion. I think there are lots sure. of people eager to ask you questions. All right, Ken, uh, I'm reaching soon. Right. So uh, to extend on that point, to reach out to the external learning communities, all right, what we do as well is that uh, we provide opportunities for them to conduct programs within NLB spaces. Uh, we provide them resources as well, uh, and an opportunity to move to NLB spaces for permanent uh, space, as well as uh, support by NLB to do community showcases. Right. Um, that's the second last point is that um, learning communities do not always exist perpetually, as I mentioned earlier, and they do come together uh, for a common cause to do projects as well. So, for example, the Great Makeover Project is one example that we have where we have people who are like minded, environment uh, conscious people coming together. Right. And for a period of time, they learn from each other about the environment that they, they are living in, in this case, Chachukang town. Right, and they try to co-solution solutions for the community in terms in relation to the environment. On the right is a is a gathering of what we call the Maka program, where we bring artists together, and uh, these artists mix uh, together with the community. All right, create a, a, a performance. All right, based on a message that they would like to bring forward. Um, last but not least, the re, re networking. All right, uh, what we do on an annual basis is that we bring our learning communities together to do some form of sharing of knowledge with each other. Um, uh, and this is what we call a five by five. Each, uh, each facilitators have about five minutes to share about, uh, about their learning community and some of the best practices as well. And we realized that uh, by doing this networking, it has helped to bring learning communities together, share resources, as well as uh, being able to help each other grow as well and survive. So, um, I have one video here, but I think I will skip the video. All right, you can actually go to the LearnX uh, community's website. All right, to have a look at the video. Uh, this video is by one of our origami uh, club, which is a very simple club, but that club has uh, grown so big. All right, that they have done community showcases, and the facilitator himself uh, has grown that learning communities to many other libraries by developing facilitators himself. So uh, have a look at the video if you can. It's about a three minutes video, right? And uh, that can be found on the LearnX uh, uh, community's website. I will put it in uh, the link later, right? Uh, with that, I end my presentation, All right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Zul. And we'll circle back to you after we hear from uh, Mr. Raja, who's the Chief uh, Operating Officer for Cinda. And uh, we've invited him to kind of give reflections on these ideas that have been shared on whether you know, it works in our context and what he feels about them. And then we'll kind of go back to uh, Zul for you to also reflect on what Griff has shared about peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, sure. Over to you, Raja. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, um, um, Justin. And uh, I think uh, it was a very rich sharing by Griff and um, uh, Zul. Uh, I, I, I want to uh, bring this to our context here as uh, SSAs and uh, uh, social service agencies and also those helping the marginalized community as uh, what um, Justin also led in at the beginning. Uh, uh, I want to reflect on also what Griff has shared. That, and and we, I totally agree that uh, knowledge should be freely shared, right? Uh, and um, it's best done together, right? And it's a social good, which uh, education is a social good, which is also Sinta's mission, right? We want to uplift the Indian community through education. Now, a lot of what was shared by Griff and uh, Zul uh, relates to learning communities for adults. Uh, and, and for us in the, the social service sector, we try to help the marginalized community. We try to uplift them through education, right? Um, I'm, I'm very thankful for, for being involved in this learning community uh, project uh, with uh, IPS, Justin. Uh, and I have to give a shout out to Beyond Social Services and, and Ranga especially, because uh, they started the, this groundwork, uh, uh, which led to us Trying, looking at uh, launching a pilot. Now, uh, this peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, in uh, um, the educational sector is not new, right? Uh, and you see that in the mainstream schools also. And uh, I think the Ministry of Education has realized this. So you see class, classrooms now 
being mixed ability classrooms, right? So because they realize that um, the stronger students can help the, the, the weaker students. Now, and in the Institute of High Learning where I was also, uh, we also understand that uh, really they learn from each other best. So we have formed peer support networks, peer tutoring networks and things like that, where seniors check in and help the, the juniors, right? Um, but now, how do we do uh, that at the community level is something that we need to explore. Uh, you know, for us at SINDA, uh, largely we have used uh, tuition, as what Justin has mentioned, and we use uh, tutors that are actually uh, uh, trained teachers to, to run small class sizes to help bridge the learning gaps for the students. Now, the reason for doing that is because then we can ensure that there is uh, standard level of quality across all the, the programs that we run. And, uh, you know, we, we are able to maintain that level. But again, uh, the ability for us to, to leverage on learning among the peers is also very important because we, we know that uh, we, as, as what Grief talked about, uh, uh, the normal teaching assumes an autodidactic kind of, uh, you know, uh, motivation level, super motivation level at the learner, right? But sometimes you need to also uh, instill that, that um, opportunity for the learner also to pick up some of that uh, other non-academic related uh, uh, values and all that from the other people in the circle, right? So uh, so we, we are looking at launching a learning circle uh, project. Uh, Zul, I checked in with Zul. Zul said he will provide the facilities we also have community partners that will look at that. Now, the key thing for us is really uh, something that is raised by Zul is also the, how do we sustain this learning community for a longer period of time? Because if the kids come into this, we have to ensure that we bring them through the entire academic calendar and also to follow them through the, the, the you know, the, when they continue on with their, their education. Now, a few things, right? Uh, learning community, we need spaces and we need facilitators. So uh, we are thinking of looking at volunteers also, but our youth from our youth peer leaders to come on board. The challenge that we will have is that, uh, you know, um, what was shared on the learning circles is that basically everybody comes in to learn a certain thing that is, and so they're all at the same starting point, right? Okay, they may be more skilled and so on, but when we form a learning circle for for the the, the children for the youth, uh, uh, for our students, we will we would have a learning circle where people would be at different levels, right? They may may come in at different levels. So the facilitator then would then uh, have to facilitate a group of people learning things at different levels, right? A P one, uh, uh, sorry, maybe a P four or a P three level, which is different, right? So we would then also need to explore how that we can stitch this together in a broader team, right? Uh, so we need to bring in resources that would then sort of paint the, the, the overall uh, topic at a broader level, but it, then it is explored at uh, the different levels at the, of, the, of the students, right? Uh, so that learning circle may consist of smaller nodes, Right, where they are facilitated by stronger students with weaker students. So some of these things we have to work out, right? Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear comments from, from uh, my, my colleagues here from the other SSAs because some of you have explored some of these things also. Uh, I think uh, what, what we, we always feel is that education is the equalizer, right? So what, this is what we want to do, right? Uh, there are many other areas that we can explore from what was raised uh, because educate, adult education and skills development is also something that I'm very, uh, is very close to my heart. But I think uh, I want to land on this particular point that maybe we can discuss a bit further. Happy to hear comments. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Uh, thank you, Raja. Maybe uh, we should hear from Griff because the, the key issue here is uh, the learning circles, Griff, you have uh, supported uh, mainly for adults. And uh, Raja's interested, you know, to get slightly younger, uh, you know, from primary school, secondary school youth, and maybe the older youth can kind of take to it. But do you get a sense that uh, children who are quite young can learn in a peer learning? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, I mean, absolutely. 
they can uh, children and, and people of all ages I think can benefit and participate and and teach in a peer learning environment I think um, I think that peer learning for youth uh, in some ways in some ways age isn't a factor but in some other ways especially when we start speaking about such you know quite young children who you know say four to four to twelve or so um, there's just a lot like peer learning for kids ends up looking quite different and and then the main difference being that with, with adults or people, you could even maybe say 14 and older, um, people who are sort of in a position to sort of make decisions for themselves and advocate for themselves, both as learners and as human beings. Um, that's a very different type of learning from, from an environment where um, a young person is, is still growing into who they are as a person, which isn't to say, obviously we're always all still growing, but I think you know what I mean. Um, and so it's not my expertise. Uh, I can say that I know a lot of, of um, organizations who I'm close to have adapted a lot of these principles for, for, for use. I, before uh, my job now, I was working at uh, MIT, um, and there, a lot of the work that came out of um, the lifelong kindergarten work group, including you know, Scratch, which is the block-based programming language for kids, uh, brings in a lot of principles of, of, of of peer learning when you see the ways that students and kids or not students kids are teaching and learning with each other um so i don't want to go too far down the path of, of saying what exactly needs to change i know it happens i know it's out there i know that a lot of the principles are similar um but you know i think in, in my organization right now at least we center ourselves around around adult education and i hope that doesn't sound like I'm avoiding your question. In, in no, no, not at all. Um, I would like to follow up though, because um, hearing from mm -hmm. Zul and from you, uh, so our national libraries kind of focus the six topics on uh, career, sustainability, reading, arts, etc. That's the scope of the kind of learning communities they would like to curate and support. And then I, I wondered, Griff, what was uh, you also you also curate? You said that you know P2P is not a search engine, but that you mm -hmm. can actually curate and your facilitators can create course out uh, curriculum. And I wondered how your coursework uh, does it look different? The scope or the types of topics that you have, how different are they from what we do here? Very similar. Um, I would loved watching the presentation. I love seeing the um, the the. Um, the flyers in particular, they look so similar to what we work with. Um, I'm sharing a link to our resources page. I, as I mentioned, we have in addition to the six or 700 courses, 12 topic guides in, in, in popular topics. Um, I, I think I shared the first three, anti-racism, business and entrepreneurship and climate change. The others are communication, computer programming, creativity, digital literacy, history, job readiness, language learning, and science. So lots of overlap and I think one of the things that I really love about um, you know, the work that Zul was talking about, which we also see, is being able to frame, I'm putting this in quotes, you know, serious topics and not serious topics in the same learning environment. And for a group of people to be really trying to learn a technical program for their, you know, for their career in the same way that they might practice ukulele or do origami, with friends, I think it's really important to hold those as equally important and equally valid um, learning communities. Uh, and so I think um, we always encourage uh, our library partners to not go too far in one direction of thinking about learning circles only as a tool for the arts or only as a tool for uh, job advancement, but to really explore the model uh, in, in different formats. And it was very clear that um, you know, that's what you all are doing uh, at the at the library as well. Um, so I, I really actually was I was thinking how how similar it was and how I would love um, you know when this is online I, I will certainly share some of Zul's work with uh, our partner libraries here in the U.S. because um, yeah just lots of similarities in the sort of differentiation between topics. I like how in the same breath you said there are serious and not serious ones and then but they're all equally important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just um, don't know. You know, you don't know what's that thing that's really gonna to speak to somebody that's gonna change their life. And right. you know, obviously we all have bills to pay. We have degrees that we're told we need to finish and I don't wanna trivialize that. Um, but it, you know, I think about my own learning experience and the things that have ended up being most impactful in my life were not the things that I would have necessarily thought. And um, I think public libraries are an incredible space to explore that for youth and for adults. Thank you. Um, Zhu, do you have any reflections on Griff's uh, sharing in general and whether some of that has any implications for how you're thinking about the 
properties. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, I, I totally agree. Uh, I, I was just looking through his uh, link there and uh, I think the learning packages are absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm probably going to uh, hijack some of the formats there to, for the packages for National Library Board as well. I, I do agree that, um, you know, that there's this thing about learning communities and it can, even within the same learning communities, it can be both serious and non-serious as well. You have your casual uh, hobbies or your casual uh, participants and you can even have your experts, people who are really into uh, the whole uh, upscaling and development and looking towards uh, learning communities as an option of uh, getting into that degree as well. Uh, we have seen, observed that as well within our own uh, learning communities, especially, especially our digital learning communities, like our coding learning communities. There are retirees, there are hobbies, as well as there are people who are really joining it because they, are, they want to upskill themselves in the coding uh, coding uh, portion. So that's the beautiful part about peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and learning communities. It really caters to a wider range of audiences. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Zul. Um, I was reflecting on the, when Grief had shared about the additional benefits of you know doing the, the learning circles and I'm imagining uh, Singapore cares so much about digital inclusion and sometimes the seniors are a bit falling behind but if they could come for a learning circle and learn anything they want but then you know they get introduced to Coursera and as part of that work you kind of insidious you're now digitally included because now you know how to go online uh, so I kind of really like that I wonder if any of the, the social service agencies that serve seniors uh, here have any reflections on that but beyond that I also think that um, uh, what struck me about uh, P2PU was that the Griff said, you know, you he makes learning circles better because of all those that came before it. And there's this kind of intentional way of taking the insights and inputs and creativity of all the learning circles and making that uh, accessible to everyone else that are interested to start that. And Zul also has that in your, you know, their five by five where the facilitators come and share. And I really like that because um, uh, even though each learning circle is a small community, the small communities learn from one another, they are networked, and, and then, you know, the, the collective intelligence grows because of that. Um, I would like to uh, now make, uh, kind of open up the to the audience for any questions you have, and uh, of course you can type in the chat, but we will give priorities to people who switch on their videos and raise their hands and want to ask a question. Um, uh, Justin, I, yes. I was wondering if we can... Uh, Kojal uh, Ranga to say something. Yes, yes, Ranga. Quite an idea you in this area. <laughs> Maybe you can come share with us an update on how uh, that is. Oh, no, Raja, saying. you put me in a spot. Okay. <laughs> I have a few of my colleagues here. We are from Beyond Social Services and we work with children and youth from rental housing neighborhoods. And uh, they are the experts, actually, because uh, my colleagues have been running the peer learning circles on the ground uh, for almost uh, more than a year now. And uh, I think I put in the chat that uh, one of the key things that uh, we felt is that it's about learning how to learn. When uh, COVID hit and many of our kids had to go on home-based learning and definitely the digital divide was huge for them. They were already being feeling lost in a physical classroom environment and then going online and learning through a screen was not easy for them. And what my colleagues have done is to take the initial model we started with and modified it along the way based on interest and behavior of the kids. So one of the key things that we are facing right now is actually how do we manage a bunch of energetic kids in a learning circle where there's really no hierarchy as such, right? So the circle doesn't create hierarchy. And, you know, uh, my colleagues uh, do have some difficult moments to share about how do we keep kids engaged and interested uh, and they still learn without making it a playground for themselves, right? So we want to still focus on the curiosity and the adventure that they have about learning and they pick the topics some of them on what they want to learn some of them will come to class with uh, what they are they can't understand back in school and that that also happens as a like a homework support uh, but yeah it's still a learning ongoing learning so we are not experts in it we uh, we learned a lot from Griff, Zul and uh, Raja today so look forward to the journey. Ranga can I ask um, is there a tension because I expect you know the parents who are worried about the kids would want the kids to go and learn their math and their English and their science <laughs> and the kids might be interested in something else I want to talk about race I want to talk about gender or how to code or how to you know all sorts of things and do you how do you manage the uh, do, do you feel that there's a pressure from your stakeholders that the learning circles you run should focus on academic topics rather than stuff that is considered peripheral but very central to what the kids are interested in? 
Yeah, definitely, Justin. I think this is also a question we'll include in our round of uh, the study that we are doing with the parents as well on how they feel. Because Singapore, we are quite driven towards grades. And uh, when the parents know that the children are coming for a learning circle program, they do expect to see the grades jump by the end of the year. And uh, that doesn't always happen. So there is an ongoing conversation we also need to have with the parents. So, you know, it's not about just the grades, but are the kids, you know, better at uh, getting the concepts or are they better at sitting down for longer periods than before? So I think this will be an ongoing struggle. But what we have done alongside is taken the peer learning model mm -hmm. and introduced it into our paid tuition program. So we had tutors that were being paid uh, and, and they used to teach one-to-one, -one, right, the kids. But what we have done is to include two or three other kids from the neighborhood in a neighbor's house so that a paid tutor comes and works with a group of children so they can learn subjects proper. So there is uh, like several variations of the program ongoing now. So that that variation where the kids are a lot more motivated to want to do better in maths in, or English, uh, they will join the paid tuition circle versus uh, they can also attend the other peer learning circle, which may not always be focused on subject learning. Uh, it's also a lot of activities and, you know, learning together, creating uh, projects and so on. Thank you so much. Hope that answers. Yeah. Yeah. Raja, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, what Ranga is sharing is, is is very much similar to our experience. You know, it's it's the different modalities of learning that you, you want to offer to your your beneficiaries. Uh, there's that uh, paid uh, uh, professional teacher model where they do the tuition. There's also that um, supervised uh, tuition kind of support, but maybe also with a professional. And then there's, of course, that uh, learning circle model where we want to simulate their curiosity and their interest, right? Uh, so so there, there are different, different uh, variations. And uh, it's not to say that uh, a, a child who, who wants to take part in one would not take part in another. Right, so it's it's an offering that we we have for them. Uh, it's it's to support them in different ways. Right, so I I I, I thought that that uh, particular um, you know um, different ways of addressing their their or their needs is 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 quite important. Can I add, can I add something briefly? I Ranga, thank you so much for those uh, those contributions. I two th thoughts I had just in this discussion. One is. Um, a lot of it's so much about teaching people how to learn, but also just teaching and showing people that there are more than one way, there's more than one way to learn. And then, you know, that I don't want to sound like a learning circle is the perfect learning environment for every person at every time and every subject. Um, but just that it is something that I think deserves a lot more space at the table of thinking about how our, how our kids or our colleagues or the seniors are, are learning because so much, you know, again, I'm talking from a US perspective, but I think it's fairly global. Um, so much of the learning we do ends up feeling um, you know, sort of lecture based in its framework. And, and just to merely provide options of learning can look differently um, is, is really, really, I think that's a really an important goal to be able to reach with any sort of program that's a little different than the norm. Um, and the second point I just want to make is I mentioned, you know, in the quotes, the serious and the unserious topics. The other dimension of that is that you could take a serious topic and, and approach it in a very unserious or a very playful way. Or you could take a very playful and a not serious topic and approach it in a very serious and committed way. And, and in the US, when I'm talking about seriousness, it's, it's really about, will this topic make you more money in your career? Because that's basically what learning and education gets reduced to a lot of the time here. But you know, we see like web design as an example where some people are coming, running a small business and they're there because you know putting a website together is that of dire importance for their livelihood. Whereas other people are there just to mess around and and make some fun thing that's just weird and follows their creativity. And I think it's cool to be able to create spaces where those people can can learn together. Thanks, Grief. I wanted to kind of follow up with uh, something that Zul had brought up. Uh, he he feels somehow that sustaining learning communities is important, and I had wondered whether. You know, if people came to learn and the learning is done and they leave, is that a bad thing? Or, or uh, do you have any views of, of, of sustaining learning communities for the longer run? Is that to me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, great question. I think that when I think that 
not everything should be forever. And I think that's one of the goal, reasons we frame learning circles as six to eight weeks is because we want people to feel like they have a successful experience. You know, we don't, not everyone needs to be making new best friends all the time and finding a new life passion all the time. I think for us, where we think about the retention or the community is with the library partner. It's like, is learning circles a program that they continue to run year after year? And, and yes, maybe the facilitators are different. Maybe the participants are different. Maybe the topics are different. But if the, the idea is valid and it's being sort of handed down between staff members and, and there's word of mouth in the community, um, we wanna see that persistence of the program. We don't necessarily want to feel like it's only successful if every single participant turns this into the most important thing in their life at the end of six weeks. I'll, I'll give a chance. I just realized that we're out of time, but I'll give a chance for one last question from the audience, if anyone has a last question. And then I'll, I'll go to uh, Raja, then Zul, and then Griff for final words. Does anybody want to ask a question? If not, uh, maybe Raja, you could kind of sum up for us what you thought about this session and what you learned from it. Yeah, I, I, I thought this, this uh, session really, uh, the, the, the biggest thing that hit me was the space is so vibrant in Singapore. I mean, Zoo sharing really showed me that, you know, how vibrant this is. Uh, and and uh, I mean, Griff really put a very good uh, broad stroke to, to the philosophy behind learning circles, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I really felt very connected to what he said about being... Uh, uh, education is for good. It's a, it's a good, right? It's, it's for good, and how we best we best learn from each other, right? So so I thought that that was uh, something that I took away from this. Uh, it's interesting because we are we are going into this. I will have to learn from people that have done this uh, uh, for a longer time. People like Zul, people like Griff, and even people like uh, Ranga and Beyond Social Services. Uh, in, in how we move forward in this area. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Raja. Uh, over to you, Zul. Right. Um, so I think one of the biggest uh, takeaway for me uh, from this presentation is how uh, Grief mentioned about um, the, 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 that knowledge should be made available to all, right? Uh, that people can gain knowledge without having to pay a premium sum of, uh, uh, of money for it. Right. And uh, learning circles and uh, learning communities actually form one of the examples of how that knowledge can be shared uh, effectively and safely in an environment uh, uh, for its members to grow together. Uh, I think that's one of my biggest uh, takeaway points. Um, and uh, I, I really hope uh, to, to work closely with uh, both uh, Mr. Raja and Ms. Uh, Griff as well uh, for future collaborations. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Zul. And uh, over to you, Griff. Yeah, um, again, I want to thank everyone and feel very grateful to be part of this, this space in this community. And I guess I'm reflecting on, you know, here we are talking about the nonprofit sector in Singapore. You know, I think there's so many unique communities that are having similar discussions around the world in different places. It's so inspiring to be able to come and, and see such alignment with, um, you know, the work that's happening with informal, uh, non-formal learning in, in Singapore. So I feel very motivated and incentivized to, you know, talk about some of the things I've seen here when I talk to my library partners. And, and I think in that way, I come back to sort of what I was saying in my presentation that, you know, we are also, you know, have the opportunity to be learning from each other, to be um, generous in how we share, to assume, you know, the best intentions with how we communicate with one another and, uh, and you know, and share basically. And, and I think in that way, we can really be stringing together uh, a, a really global network of, of organizations that are advocating um, for this way of learning that uh, is really, I think, ultimately about um, helping people figure out the path that they want to be on as, as individuals, which is really, um, you know, there's no, no more noble purpose than that. So thank you so much for the opportunity to join you all. Thank you, Griff. And I would like to, uh, you know, it's an open offer here that if uh, people are interested to form a learning circle, to learn about learning circles, get in touch with me. And I know we will either take a course with P2PU or if you need to buy Griff's uh, consultant services, <laughs> consultancy services, we'd be happy to kind of pull together a group of people interested in this and have and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Raja, Zul, and Griff, and everyone for being here. Have a good day. See ya.
Have a good day, everyone. Bye.